in this video, you'll learn how you can become a more effective service design professional by leaning into your design leadership qualities. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm Sarah. This is the Service Design Show. Welcome to episode 175. Hi, my name is Mark Fontaine and welcome back to the Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design. What are the things that make the difference between success and failure? All to help you design great services that have a positive impact on people, business and, of course, our planet. Our guest in this episode is Sarah Clearwater, a service design professional from New Zealand. Sarah recently published a report based on the research she conducted around the intersection of design and leadership. Being a service design professional requires a lot of patience and perseverance. Yes, it's easy to get frustrated when you're the last one to be invited in the room again, when you fail to secure the funds that you've been advocating for, or when progress slows down because people fail to align priorities. According to Sarah, these are all symptoms of a bigger underlying program. You won't solve these challenges by becoming better at the craft of service design. We have to take a step back and zoom out to see what's really happening here. Through her research, Sarah has found that these challenges can often be tied back to a lack of leadership. We often confuse management for leadership, but it might sound obvious these two things couldn't be more far apart. It might sound a bit harsh that we lack leadership, but the good news is, is that leadership is up for grabs for anyone who wants to. You don't have to wait till your official job title permits you to lead. So in this episode, we explore what leadership looks like in the context of service design, how you can grow your leadership qualities even when you don't see yourself as a leader right now, and how you can overcome the biggest roadblock to being an effective leader. If you stick around for the entire conversation, you'll hopefully walk away with a renewed insight that you have the power, the opportunity, the responsibility to lead, to keep raising the bar and pushing the boundaries of our practice. Don't wait for others to show the way. Your time is truly now. So I hope you're ready and excited because we're going to jump straight into the conversation with Sarah Clearwater. Welcome to the show, Sarah. Hi, Mark. Nice to be here. Yeah, awesome to have you on all the way uh, on the other side of the world compared to me, right? Uh, where are you right now? Yeah, I think we might be at polar opposites. I'm in Auckland in New Zealand. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think we are really the opposite. If we drill a hole from uh, the Netherlands, uh, we'll probably end up somewhere around, <laughs> around Auckland. <laughs> Uh, thank you for making the time and uh, jumping on this conversation on the Service Design Show with me. I'm really excited to talk about the topic. Um, before we do that, uh, we obviously want to know a bit more about you and who you are, what you do. So uh, tell us a bit more about Sarah. Sure. Uh, so I guess my little 30 second spiel is that I was born in West Berlin to East German and Egyptian parents and just before the end of the Cold War. I moved to the Netherlands uh, to get a humanities degree because your education system is quite spectacular. And then I started my career in the United Kingdom, uh, I guess, in public policy and public advocacy. And in 2011, I moved to New Zealand, which is where I called myself a designer for the very first time. And now, 12 years later, I divide my time through three different activity areas. I'm a strategic design consultant uh, for organizations who are looking to start or scale their design functions. I also mentor and coach design teams who want to take more of a leadership role inside their organization. And then I also convene the Customer Experience Collective, which is one of New Zealand's largest design communities. Awesome. Sounds like you're busy. <laughs> Somewhat. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> cool. Uh, Sarah. Um, Next to this uh, brief introduction, we always uh, do our lightning round, five questions to get to know you. 
uh, even better as a person next to a professional you haven't prepared for these questions because that makes it way more fun uh, just answer the first thing that comes to your mind and we won't dive any deeper into the, these uh, these answers but are you ready yeah let's go well let's go if you could be an animal which animal would you like to be great question i think i would love to be a panther nice uh what is your favorite holiday destination you know the things i love to do is actually spend a lot of time in libraries so my dream holiday would be a world library tour i think that would be wicked <laughs> Sounds awesome. Um, next question is, if you could have a dinner with one person, anyone alive, dead, who would you pick? Who would you like to have dinner with? Oh, I'd love to have dinner with Brene Brown. Mm. Yes, noted. We'll send the invitation. <laughs> uh, if you could recommend one book um, to all of us to read, which book would you recommend? A book I keep coming back to is Mike Montero's Ruined by Design, uh, which I think gives a really nice perspective on design ethics and, I guess, responsibility and ownership of what it means to design. Hmm. Final question, uh, tradition, is when did you first learn or hear about service design? I first heard about the term service design probably in 2004. 14 or 15 and it was a distant uh, thing that came I think out of North America or Europe but I would say my first introduction to design was actually more around design thinking and human-centered design I think service design was a much later evolution of I guess a much more mature and refined practice mm. Mm. thank you uh, those were good uh, uh, that was a good lightning round uh, let's jump into today's uh, topic and you framed it at least that's my interpretation as design leadership beyond the status quo did i get that right yeah yeah that's absolutely uh, spot on let's uh let's start by setting the stage and the context and uh I want to uh, I want to learn from you about two elements of this design leadership beyond the status quo. Let's dive into design leadership and status quo. So, let <laughs> what is your <laughs> definition? Your definition yeah. of design leadership. If you could give a thirty second pitch. So the way that I would, I guess, define design leadership is to say that actually different ways to lead in design. There is leading our practice, which is around our ability. I guess, to be self-aware and context responsive with the work that we do. And leading in that means showing up intentionally and purposefully wanting to go into a different in a certain direction. If I think about functional leadership, which is another element of design or how, you know, design leadership can show up, it's to say these are people in functions um, such as head off or manager or director and which lead design teams inside organizations. So from my perspective, there are two different ways to talk about design leadership. Okay, and I'm sure we'll explore both of them uh, a bit later. The second part of uh, sort of our title is status quo. So what mm -hmm. is the status quo? Great question. Uh, and I actually did a, a bit of research around that last year where I interviewed uh, about 28 um, so-called design leaders here in New Zealand to better understand what what design leadership might be. And the the strong perception that I guess came through the research was that when we talk about design leadership, we talk about, in fact, functional leaders. So we talk about designers who've moved into a managerial position and now lead other designers and a practice within an organization. And I guess the, the status quo element around that is that design leadership as we tie it to a function becomes limited to someone who does design moves in the leadership into a leadership function and then manages designers yeah so the status quo is leadership has turned into management or leadership 100%. equals management is that the status yes. quo that that is the status quo leadership equals managing a practice or a group of other mm -hmm. designers mm -hmm. yes and you feel that there's an opportunity to do better? I think there's an opportunity to go wider. 
Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Now, uh, thank you for, for this. This is already very helpful. You mentioned something about a research that you did. Uh, can you mm -hmm. explain a bit more? Sure. Uh, so the, the research, uh, I guess, was, was grounded in an understanding or a curiosity around some of the conversations that keep happening in the design community here in New Zealand, but also things that I observe, I guess, online through social media. And a lot of the conversation was around, should we do human-centered design or planet-centered design? Should we do co-design? You know, we all have to move to participatory design. Like there was all this bickering almost among the design community around what is good design, what is better design. It felt really competitive and it didn't feel very nurturing or very informing of our practice. And so that was the motivation behind, I guess, better understanding what good design or mature design looks like. And the assumption that I've made in the research is that leadership is a proxy for maturity. And so that's where, I guess, conversations or interests around leadership came into play. And what that's ended up being was sort of 28 qualitative conversations with um, people in or near formal design leadership functions who helped me better understand what their world really looks like. And out of that, um, came a definition of design practice, a definition of design leadership, and an understanding of how else we might grow our practice for it to be more mature, but also more impactful and more relevant to the times and places that we practice. Mm -hmm. And if anyone is curious, the report is publicly available, right? The report is publicly available. Anybody can download that from my website, which is sarahclearwater.com. We'll make sure to add the link. Okay. so. You have uh, spoken to quite a few people. You have done a lot of thinking and reflection about this, uh, which puts you in a very good position to have this conversation uh, and maybe provoke some ideas here. Now, the perspective on leadership as a role where we envision a future and work towards the future versus uh, leadership as in managing, um, I'm sort of curious, um, what have you learned about the sort of symptoms or how, how do we notice the lack of I don't, the lack of the other type of leadership? Maybe I don't know if we have mm. two words for these two uh, different types yeah. of leadership, uh, but sort of the, the future envisioning leadership. How do you how mm. do we uh, feel, see, experience the lack of it? That's a really good question. Um, I think that I can see two answers to your question, so I might offer both of these. So if I if I think of the the lack of so the two leaderships I talked about was practice leadership and functional leadership, and what we observe is that functional leadership often takes place, but practice leadership is lacking. Well, how that shows up is that we put a lot of responsibility on the design leader to advocate at executive level, to drive change, to envision the design future, to bring customer into the executive. But, it, but the design team is almost stuck in its inability to translate that vision into their own work, right? So it's one thing to go, you know, be part of an organization and be part of a squad or a tribe and go, oh, I'm the, I'm the designer here, I can help you do research. It's a very different thing to understand the value connection between design activity and organizational strategy. And practice leadership, no matter where you are in the organizational hierarchy, shows up in your ability to drive change through your practice in an agreed direction that your leader and your team are set. That's one way of looking at that where I see leadership being absent in like a functional context, for example, is when the head of the organization, sorry, the head of the function isn't able to bridge, I guess, humanity-centered ways of thinking and working with commercial realities. And ultimately it's up to the function head to create the structures and the conditions for the design team to succeed. And so when we see what we see here or have seen quite frequently and might see more of is continued restructures, 
you know, um, teams being resized, being renamed, being reallocated, needing to do a lot with very little, they are often symptoms of teams' inability to communicate their value and to find a way to negotiate and navigate the obvious tension between being human-centered and being profit-focused. And it's not just that we have to navigate this tension, we also have to find a way to obviously start realizing a more human-centered way of doing business, which is what our mandate ultimately is. So, um, yeah, the, the, the struggle we have is to connect the human-centered way of working with doing business. Is that, a, is that the bigger bigger problem? Like if the other things are the symptoms, is that is that sort mm -hmm. of the key that you have found, the, the key struggle, the key challenge? In simple terms, I think, you're, I think you're right because we have to be part of the system in order to change the system. And as designers, our mandate is for change. Mm -hmm. I'm very curious. Um, how did we get here as in is it is it uh is it by chance that we didn't take up this leadership role is it a lack of training is it uh, is it uh do we want to avoid this responsibility maybe i don't know what are, what have you heard and seen how did we get here as a community so i think one thing that is both design's greatest asset and its greatest fallacy is our idealism and our desire to do good in the world, right? And that's in a way makes us resilient and strong in the face of adversity, but also can bring us down because we're constantly being told, no, you know, you need to be more realistic or how does this going to make me money? Or we're constantly running into doors. And if we don't have support from a community or wider team or a strong leader, to sustain, I guess, our vision, our hope, our intent while navigating the current reality, I think it's just simply, it wears down. It's really, really hard work. So we're looking for practical idealism or pragmatism and idealism, <laughs> is, is that? <laughs> I, I think we're looking, we're looking for reassurance that the belief that there's a better or different way to do business is not just necessary, but also valid. And then we're needing the tools and the mindsets to start acting on that belief, even if we get knocked back. So mm -hmm. I think as a discipline, what we're looking for is resilience. How, in, in which sense resilience? How are we looking for that? I think or that is something that we that would really support us and make us stronger because of the the tension and the challenge we bring to the status quo of business. If we can find a way to build our resilience in, in our beliefs and our practices and tools while working on changing the businesses that we are part of, that can set us up for better success. What happens if we don't build that resilience? I think we burn out. Mm -hmm. Which yeah. is already happening. Yeah. On I don't know if it's on a large scale, but from the conversations I've been having with the service design community, there are already many people who sort of get fed up and, and start questioning and doubting if they they want to put in the effort uh, to to fight for the quote unquote right cause if the rest yeah. the, the typical quote here is um, that an organization doesn't even let you do the job that they hired you for. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know. Do you recognize something like that? I see that a lot. I see that a lot. And I it goes as far as like some designers have basically said, I'm no longer going to be a designer. I'm going to go into product or I'm going to become a business analyst or I'm going to, I need to, I need to step into a function where the value is understood so that I have to continuously battle just to do my job. So, yeah. If we maybe can transition into some stories and examples to make this a bit more tangible, um, yeah. maybe tapping into your own experience and mm -hmm. focusing on that uh, practice leadership uh, area. Mm -hmm. Have you encountered situations in your own practice where sort of this the lack of it or maybe uh, a scenario where this uh, 
manifest it very clearly mm. uh, that can help us make this a bit more tangible? Sure. So as, as, as I guess a bit of context, as, as part of the report findings, a lot of the, lead, the, the sources of leadership where our practice matures sits in our ability to be self-aware and context aware. And that's something that's continuously evolving. And so if I think about a time where my leadership was lacking, it was in a, a, in a project I was running with a not-for-profit, with international not-for-profit a few years ago. And most of my work sits in the commercial or large government organization space. And so not-for-profit international development was a really new field. They were really keen on co-design. Um, it was during COVID and I was up for the challenge. I was really excited by it. Uh, and I sort of went in all guns blazing and I had my toolkit full of code design tools and had, you know, my sort of everything mapped out, like the research plan and the project plan, and I was ready to go. And something that became evident really, really quickly is that I didn't fully understand how my existing mental models around, um, you know, business commercials, around power structures, um, around privilege, were showing up not necessarily in the way I was thinking or trying to work, but in the tools and the processes I was applying. So to give you a really tangible example, Miro is not a tool that works well with, um, I guess, groups of people who don't use it as their everyday platform. But as designers through COVID, we, we became literate in them. And most businesses use Miro as a as a foundational tool in their creative and collaborative practice, right? And I just took that and dumped that um, into a community in South Asia. And what happened? And, that, <laughs> and so what happened as a result, and they were very kind and very generous um, with their feedback uh, and their space to let me learn. But what happened was that I effectively alienated part of the project team. I re like reduced the speed of the project, like I slowed everything down. I created frictions and silos among the different groups who were trying to collaborate together because the tool I was applying was not fit for purpose. Very fascinating story. And um, can you maybe zoom into the moment where you realize that this was happening and sort of that this was the root cause like when did you did yeah. you have an epiphany what, like how did this go uh, the epiphany of course happens in the middle of the half day workshop that you've been preparing for for four weeks um and then you know the mirror board was set up it was beautiful i thought i'd briefed my collaborators here in new zealand really well which are part of the uh, client organization and yeah, we, the sort of I started the workshop, we did the introductions, and I was like, right, let's, you know, let's get to work. And we broke into groups, and we only had three facilitators for three groups. So I couldn't hear what the others were doing. But I was taking my group through my part of the workshop, and the responses only came from one or two people, which I thought was odd, because we'd done so much in, you know, building connections and relationships and safety. And then looked across the mirror board and those spaces were also empty. And so what I did was to cut the workshop short, well, to stop the activity and to bring everybody together and basically have a reflective conversation around what just happened. Um, and so that was the first conversation that happened with everybody in the room where people just said, oh, this is a bit hard to use. We really love the idea, but we just can't execute on this really well. And then the second conversation ha happened with the in a project team, my client team, and they sort of said, oh, you know, we really struggled to use it. We didn't really know how to navigate the space. And I then approached key stakeholders, stakeholders individually and had one-on-one -on -one conversation. And that's when the insight around sort of power and privilege really emerged. And when I had to go, oh, shoot, I think I just, you know, stepped into it. So... Which question did you ask yourself that made you reflect that this wasn't uh, a matter of 
I need to educate these people about how to use this tool. I need to better structure this mm. workshop because I can imagine a lot of people like that's the, the initial response. Okay, so mm. we need to use a different tool or we need to have a different agenda. Again, which what what caused you mm. to take a step back and reflect? Reflection is a key leadership practice and a reflection is an intentional part of my practice. And so I encourage that to be part of I guess others too. But to come back to your very good question around what is the question that I asked that led me not to believe that it was someone else's fault or that I just had to be a better designer was the, I guess, the the understanding that whatever I bring to a conversation comes with a set of my own biases and beliefs and mindsets. So I know that whatever I bring to this conversation to every workshop, I bring with me a set of un, unsurfaced beliefs. And so what I started to do was to, I guess, interrogate the tool that I was using and to go, why is this not working for me? Why is it not working for other people? Where did we get hung up? And um, why did this conversation become a, a two-way conversation between me and the project lead, not everybody in the room? So I just started drilling down into why things were happening. And then I'm trying to go, what would happen? So I, I already have a mental model around what, whatever I bring to a project is around philosophies, principles, and processes. And I go, which of my processes here show up? How do they show up? Which of my principles show up? How do, which of my philosophies show up? And why do they show up? And in going through these almost three, I guess, levels of resolution of inquiry, that's what brought out the power and privilege because it was some of my philosophies that showed up in the tool of Miro, you know? And what was the philosophy to be specific? So the philosophy, you know, I was like, oh, collaboration is really important in this you know distributed world Miro is the way to collaborate but collaboration wasn't the important philosophy it was participation right and it was enabling of voices to be heard and surfaced the philosophy that I needed to bring was not about design thinking or human-centered design the philosophy was about how can I help those who are least often heard and least often acted upon, how can I bring them to the surface? And so the reframe that happened was around saying, okay, I think I've stipulated too much of how we will work and what we will use. And so I went back to the team and said, this is what I think we have to achieve next. How might we get there? And that is when they came up with their own way of working and approaching, which was totally different. Very interesting. It, there's a lot of personal self-reflection. Self-reflection is always personal, I guess. Uh, and understanding uh, your biases, uh, like you said, the mental mm -hmm. models that you bring and being uh, aware of that and con uh, conscious of that. Do you also make those things explicit do you communicate those things with the people around you or is it something that you try to incorporate in just in your work it's a really really good question and i'd say that i haven't been consistent my aspiration is to be more explicit um, but i find that i i tend to limit that to my immediate collaborators and that isn't always helpful Though not always sufficient, I suppose. I think it's, I think it's a really good starting point. So people who you work closely with, who support you, for them to understand your defaults, is life changing. Mm -hmm. But in this mm -hmm. scenario, yeah, maybe I think I'm, I'm probably just now reflecting on this with you live on the show. Um, I think I actually haven't been explicit about that particular mental model. And that Do was you think that would be helpful? I think so. So to give you another example, mm -hmm. if you want to, yeah. Sure. So one one bias I have is around finding commonality in patterns. Because of 
my upbringing and the way I guess I was raised, I was always, I grew up at intersections. So my desire is always to build bridges and bring things together. But what can happen is if I overuse that lens, I tend to, I can bring things together that shouldn't be going together. I I, it's easy for me to go, oh, it's all the same. Oh, these are the things that go together. They are the things that you have in common. Okay, this is easy, next. Right? Sometimes more delineation is required. And so with my closest collaborators, I purposefully seek people who are, are less inclined to find commonalities, for example. So when I assemble project teams around certain challenges, I try to do so in ways where we all bring a complementary, not just skills, but most importantly, mindsets and experiences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're focusing right now on maybe personal leadership and understanding who you are mm -hmm. and to a certain extent, what are you bringing or what are you lacking? What are your strengths and weaknesses? Yeah. How does this connect to the practice lead that we talked about? Mm -hmm. Yes. So the practice, design practice, as I define it, is the interplay of my craft and my context. Yeah. So my practice emerges when what I know shows up in the real world. And the leadership element around that is to, to constantly navigate that there is an exchange. So for example, if I have a set of corporate tools around human-centered design and service design, and I bring that into a not-for-profit context, my craft, my tools have to change. But as a result, this new context has altered my craft, right? So my practice constantly does this, if you will. It constantly um, goes in, through an infinity loop. The leadership is to be aware of that and drive the evolution of my practice intentionally as to achieve a certain outcome. For example, could be something as simple as, you know, I want a certain organization to progress the development of, of, of an app or a website. Yeah. My goal as a designer is to ensure that there are certain needs of the user that have been met. In order to achieve that, I can't just focus on the app or the website. I have to think about the wider context that this interaction takes place in and influence and drive change around all the conditions that that are responsible for bringing that app or that website to life. So my leadership sits in seeing what needs to be done and dr like driving into that direction, but also allowing others to come on that journey with me. Yeah. And I made the, the false, uh, it's not an assumption, but uh, I focus on, on just a tiny bit because I said it's a, it's a self-reflection and personal, but of course you're reflecting on your uh, actions in the bigger context. You're seeing how right. you uh, how you show up in a culturally different contexts. What happens? So you need mm -hmm. to be aware of those all those other things and how they influence your response, your the tools that you use, the mm -hmm. processes that you apply. So th that's that's the interplay, right? That's that's correct. That's one hundred percent yeah. right. Yeah. And you know that this interplay is not working when certain things happen, right? So a lot of the teams that I, I work with tend to say things like, we, we are stuck in research. I, I can't get to, to deliver anything because all I get asked for is, is customer research. Teams might say, well, I'm always the last one to be invited as the designer mm -hmm. when all the important decisions have already been made. Yeah. Or they go, we, like everybody says customer is important, but I, I can't get budget for more research or another designer, or I can't get onto this big project. I can't unlock attention or funds or resources for my work. And all of these are symptoms in our unawareness of the context conditions that we have to lead into with our practice. It's a, it's a big question, but how do we then lead in into death i don't know have you found yeah. a few key 
characteristics that allow us to go beyond just being very good at our craft mm -hmm. to being good, very good at our craft and making it fit, better fit and align mm -hmm. to the context that we're operating in. Yeah. It's, it's a huge question. And I think that is, you've nailed, you know, the, <laughs> you've nailed it. This is the big question. And um, I guess a couple of things I can share that I know have worked for me or that I've seen work for others sit around um, being able to read your context. So they're always, and so this is borrowed from um, navigational leadership, or sorry, wayfinding leadership, which is an indigenous concept uh, here out of New Zealand. That is a great book, by the way, Wayfinding Leadership, I recommend it. And there is a, there is a notion of what they call signs. And so wayfinding, I guess as I understand it, um, is the practice of of crossing the oceans using you know the stars and the sea and the land around you and if we translate that metaphor to our context what this suggests is that every journey we go onto into every journey that we lead that we participate in is surrounded by signs that allow us to make the decision of where to go next so one thing that is fundamentally helpful in showing up in a leaderly way and also, uh, I guess, driving change within our, our organisations is to be cognizant of those signs. Perfect as well, examples of these signs would be strategy documents, all hands, CEO presentations, things you uncover in conversation with your colleagues. You know, I think one thing that we sometimes forget as designers is to eat our own dog food when it comes to who's our user. Yes, they are customers, but everybody we're working with are also our users. How do we empathize with them? You know, what are the key themes and insights that are emerging from your conversations with your colleagues? And how might you use them to better direct your design activity to bring them on the journey? Because I think the key fallacy I want to point out, that this is not about becoming a business-centered designer. This is not about giving up your values or your beliefs around what's right for the customer. This is about working with the conditions that you've been given and finding a way to, to still embed the customer into the business environment. I know you said there are a few things, but I, I love this one and I would love to zoom into it. Um, mm -hmm. Wayfinding leadership. I'm definitely going to mm -hmm. add that book to my reading list. I love that. Yeah. And um, I love analogies and metaphors. So navigating uh, through this using stars and I don't know, wind and uh, landmarks makes a lot yeah. of sense. And um, you said s using signs. Uh, I added the word clues here and mm -hmm. there are tons of them. Uh, in when you're mm -hmm. inside an organization or working with an external client, there are tons of signs, there are tons of clues uh, that show you what's happening. Uh, it's just a matter of developing and awareness and, and being able to notice them and, and taking the time and having the patience and, and being open to these clues and signs, which are already out there. You, you, you don't even have to do any additional effort. Uh, they are already there. And like it's bringing those clues, signs into your practice and how you show up on a day to day basis. The, does it make any yeah. sense? 100%. That is spot on. Exactly. Was there anything else? Because you mentioned wayfinding leadership. Uh, I felt that you had yeah. a few more things uh, you wanted to share. So I think the other thing that pops into mind, and someone else said this, um, and they said, you know, go, I go where the energy is. And I think it relates to the previous point, but we shouldn't forget the power of our intuition and our gut when it comes to doing our work. And every environment, every room you step into, there's energy, right? Are you riding the wave or are you trying to fight against it? And I think it's, it's important for us to be deliberate, really deliberate in our ability to choose our battles and find the waves we want to ride and then ride them. And then, again, the balance is always how do I work with what's in, in front of me and how do I bring to it 
what I know to be true and important? And how might we together work towards an outcome that ultimately achieves what I want to achieve without neglecting or alienating those who might think or work differently from me? So if we try to bring this into uh, a typical service design project or design project, mm -hmm. how would this manifest? Uh, feeling where the energy mm -hmm. is and riding the wave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really good question. So I think sometimes we can get really uh, frustrated or almost offended when someone goes, when someone doesn't want to start at the beginning of the project, right? When so, of the process, when someone goes, oh, we we don't need research. I just wanted to do a journey map with fictional personas and go with it. Or I just wanted to do some customer testing, right? We've got the prototype. It's going to be released next week. And all we need is to tick the box for the buttons and, you know, that sort of stuff. And as designers, we can go, oh, I don't want to be involved in that because we haven't done it right, you know. But what if instead we go, hey, you've done all of this without involving the customer or you're currently not ready to involve the customer. I want to flag that this is a risk and this is what could happen for you. But here's how I can help you. So design, I think, is also a learning practice more so in some instances than a makership practice. And so how might we learn with our collaborators and our colleagues in ways that help us evolve our understanding and connection with customers and each other? So this is uh, adopting a yes and mentality. Um, I can imagine that, that there will be friction where you feel, okay, this is mm -hmm. not living up to my pro personal and professional standards. Right. like. Is that, is that a matter of experience and sort of personal boundaries or are there any guides? I guess, again, I'd say there are two, two answers to that. So we all have boundaries. We all must have boundaries. And there are points at which we should not, we should not cross our boundaries. These boundaries relate to ethics, to values and beliefs. They relate around how we might cause harm. You know, they relate around how we believe or to interact or not interact with other humans. Like, they are baseline boundaries that we do not cross. These boundaries relate to things like, you know, I was working with a, to give you an example, I was working with a company um, several, several years ago on a technology transformation project. And they were developing a mobile phone application to try and automate some of their customer acquisition. And they had a really high, I guess, risk profile and that their appetite for risk was very low. The algorithm that underpinned customer acquisition was fundamentally discriminatory against minorities. And I don't mind just testing a thing if that's important to you. I don't mind building a journey for you if that is your starting point. But what I won't do as a designer is support a piece of work that I know will harm others. That's a boundary I have, and that is a boundary I will not cross. So I will not continue to work on this project, right? That's a hard boundary. But to go, I'd love to do some research, but you won't let me. It's more of a, that's what a toddler does. <laughs> so the, so the, yeah, yeah, the boundary is between, or the distinction is between intent like, what's the intent? Mm -hmm. What is the goal that we're striving towards? And that's almost non-negotiable versus yeah. your craft and how do you bend and tweak and uh, modify and contextualize your process, your tools to achieve mm -hmm. that goal? Like, how fluid or flexible are you with that? Yes, and um, I think the question is also, we might not be able to get a perfect project going here. But what we might do is move in increments towards a better way of doing things. So if I can build excitement around a customer journey, or if I know that the organization has an appetite for journey frameworks, why not go with it? Even if there is very limited research or all of it is, is just quant research, or you know, even if it's just a little bit, it's, it's about perspective how much time have we got here to drive change? Can I, can I, is it palatable for me? Yes, based on my values, very, very important. 
can my tools make it a little bit better? You know, can I modify something that I know to help someone else understand the customer? This is the navigation activity. This is the leadership. This is the moments of tension. I think the uh, the trap or pitfall uh, is that as service designers, we already see what's possible. We envision the mm -hmm. future and we know like if we all do it in the ideal or perfect way, what's what's possible like uh and mm -hmm. and we want to get there and uh, when we need to take smaller steps it almost feels like we're compromising like this is not good mm -hmm. enough we like if we just mm -hmm. change these five things we can deliver so much more value yeah. um I, I have some thoughts about about this but how do you marry these two things like knowing mm -hmm. what's in store and and, and challenging yeah. your clients maybe to Come on, mm -hmm. let's change a few things and then this will be so much better versus, okay, mm -hmm. let's take some baby steps. So I think it depends also on our positioning, right? So if we're external contractors or consultants, there's a massive expectation around short-term deliverables, right? If I'm hired for 12 weeks to deliver a thing, my ability to drive long-term change is small. If I'm in-house, I have the ability to pursue long-term changes while delivering short-term wins. It's understanding our position in that system well enough to make a judgment call around what's possible for us, not just what's possible for the system we're trying to change, but what is possible realistically for me as a service designer at this moment in time under these conditions. And that I think is what the what the leadership vision has to be. And it's not to say that that vision can't change in three weeks or three months or three years. But I think we're setting ourselves up for failure when we think we can turn around an organization to become a design-led or customer-led organization in 12 weeks or even 12 months. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of those um, perspective of or accesses of leadership that you understand your limitations and uh, mm -hmm. your abilities and being able to um, align those things with what you could potentially achieve. That's the, mm -hmm. at least that's how I'm hearing and reading your story, that that's where leadership sort of uh, shows up, that you're able mm -hmm. to connect what's possible with mm -hmm. what, what might be. Uh, yeah. I hope I'm making sense here. <laughs> yes, you are. See, I, I think the other thing to remember is that our ability to drive change is only ever as um, as great as the quality of our stories that that tell people what that future is going to be like, right? So, if if I have a vision in my mind around what an organization could be but I can't tell a story around that vision in a way that is compelling for others, there is no way that I'm ever gonna get there or the organization. So I think when we think about leadership, we often think it's just about the actions that we take. But the second part of that is our ability to bring others on a journey. And that requires two things, an explicit invitation to go on that journey, and then at least an initial framework for participating in that journey. And if we can't communicate that through our stories, we can't, we're not gonna get wherever we wanna go. Uh, I don't know the exact quote, so I'm not going to use it here, but there is a beautiful quote by a philosopher uh, about that if you want to inspire people to travel and explore foreign lands you don't tell them about the features uh, of your boat you tell them about yeah. the future that awaits right and i nice. think that's something yeah. similar here <laughs> like we shouldn't yeah <laughs> we shouldn't be telling about how how great our process is or how beautiful the tools are that yeah. we use we should be telling a compelling story uh about the future that we want to create and uh, mm -hmm. give people the confidence to take that first step with us. A hundred percent. And that future has to be painted in words 
and in language and in concepts that the audience understand, right? So if I talk about customer-led organizations to an organization that hasn't bought into the value of customer, I'm telling an irrelevant story, yeah? So I might start my story of a bright future around an organization that can make evidence-based decisions, that can respond to market needs and trends quickly and informed in an informed way. In 12 months' time, that story might change to something, you know, an organization that, you know, is seen in the market as being relevant and meaningful and collaborative. And then in 24 months' time, I might talk about their customer vision. So the same story, the same vision that I have today has to sound different today than tomorrow and then the day after. We don't evolve our stories as well as we like to, but just as our practice has to evolve with the ever-changing conditions that we find ourselves in, so have our stories. What, what would you say to someone who isn't in a functional leadership position right mm -hmm. now and feels that the practice leadership role or responsibility lies in that functional leadership position, not within the, within themselves. Mm -hmm. I would ask them if that, where that question comes from in that, is that a question born from fear that you are unable to lead or is that question born from fear that you will be being rejected if you do show up to lead? Is it, where does that position come from? Hmm. And so yeah. it's it's an important question, I guess, and uh, I'm not sure how. I hope many people who are listening right now are actively thinking about mm. how they are leading the practice. Um, mm. And if they are not, I think this is a very good invitation to to start doing some reflection mm. around this. Sort of heading towards the end of our conversation, I'm always curious, like which advice you wish you mm. would have gotten five years ago or which advice would you give yourself to a five-year younger Sarah? I think something that I would have loved to have known five years ago is that we all have the potential to lead and that we can shape our own leadership experience. Like there's, I guess the thing about functional leadership is that we see leadership in a particular way and assume that leadership must be this way. And so when people go, I don't want to lead, it might just be, I don't want to lead that way. And that's totally fine, right? And so for me, knowing five years ago that I have the potential to lead if I so choose would have been really liberating for me. I think that's one thing. I think the other thing that is really interesting for me or that would have been really helpful is to know that good design is context dependent there is no design best practice at this moment in time. There is only responsive design that is respectful and um, I guess responsive to the people we work with, the people we work for, and our own values, beliefs, needs, and boundaries. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about good design to one another, I think it would be more helpful for us to go under which conditions have you found this to work rather than this is the best way to do a journey map or this is the best the human centered design or earth centered design or co-design or under which conditions is the practice that you advocate for relevant and useful to bring the customer to the conversation yeah and understanding those nuances uh, it requires stories is very hard um to mm. do a course around this or to read this in a mm. book because like yeah. we it's 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 alluring and tempting to uh, get recipes and focus on recipes yes. but it's really the context and the nuances uh, that matter i i do i want to i want to uh focus on one more thing because it makes me curious while you were sharing this and the advice you would get you would given yourself is there such a thing as no leadership because uh, let me explain mm -hmm. because i think mm -hmm. the um, um the story here might be like uh, you're always leading by example your actions 
or the lack of your mm. actions is is setting an example mm. and if we say you're leading by example then you're always leading in a mm. certain way consciously unconsciously so is there a thing as no leadership i guess the absence of leadership is the absence of direction and the absence of pathways towards a different future mm -hmm. i think that another interesting way to look at leadership is to understand that leadership cannot be continuous so when we look at leaders we think that they're a leader at all times but what the research suggests well beyond my research paper is that leadership shows up in the spaces in between people leadership shows up in between through relationships leaderships are moment or events in time so what that means is that i can choose to be a leader at work and not at home i can choose to be a leader in this workshop and not in that one i can choose to be a leader in this team but not in that i can choose to lead in particular scenarios but not in others right and so sometimes the absence of leadership is actually a blessing because it allows for someone else to step into their leadership and sometimes leadership is stepping away for someone else to lead that's better that's <laughs> i love that one and uh, it makes absolute sense that the uh, like the lack of the no you have to have if you want to lead you have to have a north star and even if that north star tells you to step to take a step back but without a north star you can't lead you're just you're just busy you're just rowing mm -hmm. without having uh, a direction or uh, a goal or a destination maybe in uh, i love metaphors mm -hmm. so we're, you can't lead if you don't have a destination yes i but i think i would be i would say that the destination hasn't it doesn't have to be a destination i think it has to be a direction and for me the distinction is important because the destination presumes in a way that we have answers when uh -huh. very often we don't a direction can simply be different to where we are today so we're going north we're heading towards a more human-centered future rather right. than uh we're going towards uh, a very specific crystallized we're going to the uh we're going to manhattan or we're going to uh broadway that's not that's not the destination that we are discussing or referring to we're going north or we're going to a better future right that that's that's the uh that's the north star 100 percent. that's exactly it if um someone has listened to our conversation so far what is the one thing you hope that they will remember I hope that the one thing that they will remember is that they have the ability to lead um, and all they need to do is find out what they can bring to their context to show up in a leaderly way and I hope that they decide that they are ready to give it a try. The other thing I would say around this is that you don't have to get it right first time around but without trying you're never going to get there. Leadership is also a learning journey. And so why not start today and find a moment in your work life that you want to start leading and just do it. And on that note, uh, I want to thank you, Sarah, uh, for sharing this uh, important topic, encouraging topic, inspiring topic. Uh, let's hope uh, people will dig into this, do some reflection and uh, read some books, read the report. Uh, really thankful that you came on and shared this. Thank you so much, Max. It's been a joy talking to you today. What's the single most important quality of an effective leader according to you? We'd love to know. So please leave a comment down below. I want to thank Sarah once again for coming on the show and addressing this important topic with us. If you want to learn more, check out Sarah's report using the link that's in the show notes of this episode. Finally, if you enjoyed this conversation, and you haven't done so already, please click that like button. This lets me know if we're on the right track addressing topics like this. My name is Mark Fontaine and I want to thank you 
for spending a small part of your day with me. Please keep making a positive impact and I look forward to see you very soon in the next video.